Good morning. morning. Happy almost Christmas. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. Now tell me, can anything in the world top the birth of a child? I mean, on this side of heaven, is there anything better than all of the watching and all of the waiting when you are expecting? Now, of course, husbands, guys, we only know it secondhand, right? But it's still pretty darn good. And one of the things that I love best about it are all of the the rituals and routines. Everything from handing your bride a wet, warm washcloth, right? For the morning sickness. How could that be good? Because of what's coming. But then even the rituals get better than that. All, everything to the uh, prenatal appointments, you see the first ultrasound, and if you're brave, you find out whether you're getting a boy or a girl. If you're courageous, you leave it until the day of your child's birth. You pack the ready bag. And for, I, 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 like I said, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't pretend to speak for women because if I do, I'll get in big trouble. But as a father, The weeks leading up and the countdown and the excitement and the most amazing thing I've ever seen on this side of heaven, uh, aside from the birth of my own daughter, was at about seven months, a little footprint appeared on mom's tummy. Is that not incredible? And so... Also, as we celebrate the birth of Christ, it's not just get to Christmas, say hooray, uh, have New Year's, and then get depressed in January. It's a little better than that. There's, there's a, there's a buildup. We are journeying with all the biblical uh, characters, and, and, and part of what we get to do is get to relive the story as if it's happening for the first time, because by faith, Because there's no beginning or end to God, we do actually relive the story as if it's never happened. It's a beautiful thing. And we mark the passage with with candles. Next week will be a pink candle. We've already started the countdown. But if we're just trying to get to Christmas and get it over then my words should be grace, mercy, peace, and 16 shopping days left to Christmas. And if that's all it is, where's the joy? This morning in our series, Behold the Child, Jesus comes to set you free from sorrow. And there's a lot of joy assassins out there in the world. Everything from overloaded to-do lists to uh, hectic schedules. But as we said last week, it's not the hectic of the season that robs us of joy. It's the distraction from Jesus Christ. That's what does it. That is the mechanism. That is what the joy assassin, the devil himself, that's the tool that he loves to use and he gets us too busy for our own good and he gets us too distracted for our own good and our joy goes how many of you remember um, Wile E. Coyote and and, and the Roadrunner remember kids you can ask your mom and dad what that's about that's what happens to our joy well Herod is a good example of someone who missed out. The Magi come after Jesus is born. I know I'm a little ahead in the story, but it's still a good message for those of us who are waiting. They came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And when the king is not happy, neither is the kingdom. And all Jerusalem was disturbed with him. Herod sees competition. 
Herod has a lust for power. He's a little king in a little kingdom compared to all of the kingdoms in that area during biblical times. Herod's little piece of real estate is just a postage stamp. A few thousand acres, give or take. What's the big deal? Yet Herod is not focused on that star. He is focused on himself. He's focused on his ambition to hold on to what he's got. And so when Herod got disturbed, so did the rest of Jerusalem because he also, in his desire to hold on, tried to eliminate his competition. All male children two years old and younger were killed by Herod to make sure in his mind that this new king is not going to gain any traction in his kingdom. And so what could have been joy for Herod goes... Now, after having said that, I'm going to say something really challenging. But I'll ask it in the form of a question. Is there a little bit of King Herod in us? Now, before you say no, I need to tell you that my grandfather, who was a pastor, always said, Greg, if you're going to preach it, you better have the text kill you and raise you up before you start talking about anybody else being killed and raised up, right? Killed by the law, convicted by the law, and raised up by good news. And when I hit upon this, I said, yes, that's the question to ask. And then a little voice said to me, have you asked yourself the question, yes? And I have to say, honestly, yeah, there's a little bit of Herod in me. Do I have my own little kingdoms, my own little things that I want to protect? I don't want God to be part of it. Yeah, sometimes that happens. Do I get distracted and look at everything else but the one thing, that star in the sky that God, by the way, since he's God of heaven and earth, and, and, and that means God of, of stars and planets, just happened to make this star travel across the sky in defiance of all natural law and come to the place where Jesus was born over Bethlehem. Am I looking at the star consistently? Or am I looking at the number of messages on my so-called smartphone? Herod stumbled over his ego, sometimes we do. He tripped over his unbelief, sometimes we do. Do we skip the journey with Jesus in favor of the quick fix? You see, when joy departs, sorrow makes your heart its home. Sorrow stays longer and it reaches deeper than sadness. The longer it stays, the heavier it gets. Sorrow feeds off of unbelief. Sorrow tells you that joy can never be yours. But Christ answers your sorrow by who he is. And he's not a little king of a little kingdom, but the king of kings and the king of your life. Here's what Micah said. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the, the, the clans of Judah, though you're just a little itty-bitty kingdom, out of you will come for me one who will be over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And he's not saying, gee, wow, look, a really old guy is going to be your king. Ancient times. One of God's names is the Ancient of Days. And he goes on to say, he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. You see the picture of Jesus carrying one of his sheep. Any one of us could, could, could superimpose our picture over the sheep being carried by Jesus. He's the king of kings who comes to be your shepherd's servant. He's the one in the majesty of the name 
of the Lord your God who comes to you. And he says of his people, they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. I need that king. How about you? I need a king that I'm not in charge of. A king that I cannot control. A king who is so unpredictable in that I can't possibly guess what is in the mind of God. And at the same time, so predictable that we know what we're always going to get from him. That our king is a king of love. He's a shepherd of love. He's the king of king who says, take it easy, will you? All the craziness, let go of it and focus on me. And you know what? We always have two options. We can go through life being crazy or we can just go through life. Either way, you're going to get there. Whether you feel crazy and, and hectic and stressed or not, you're going to get there. And Jesus says, get there with me. Let me lead you through this season. Let my face be superimposed on that Bethlehem star. The Magi arrived and worshipped Christ. And we know he's a king because when they worshipped him, one of the, the words for worship in the New Testament means to bow down and kiss the feet of the king. That means get down on your face. Your chest is touching the floor. And you wriggle forward and you grab the king's feet and you kiss them. That was a form of royal worship in Jesus' time. That's what they did. And I'm not thinking it was the gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh that were so important as much as it was that they bowed down. Proskuneo, from where we get the word prostrate. They bowed down, grabbed his feet, and worshipped the Christ child. Matthew says in the biblical text, the Magi rejoiced a great joy greatly two greats two joys in the same sentence and this Christ child gives us not always what we want but always what we need the one who came in the flesh the one who lived a life like you and I live the one who was crucified in the flesh and raised alive from the dead the one who's coming back the birth of the one whom we celebrate, who gives us what we need, life, forgiveness, and purpose. We call that transcendent joy. That's the kind of joy that rises above all circumstances. It can't be, it can't be dumbed down. It can't do the splat. It's a joy that is so durable that it's been around for the better part of 2,000 years. And this Christmas, millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people all over the world will stop and thank God that he's taken our sorrow, our little kingdoms, and he's given us joy. To God be the glory, and to us be the blessing, in Jesus' name, amen.